just another for my students. And someone mentioned the recent experiments with chimpanzees in teaching them fragments of or large chunks of sign language. Mm -hmm. And was they wanted his response. And his response may give you some hint of where on the uh, where he thinks language mm -hmm. comes from, because he objected to the notion that the apes in fact had language. Yeah. Refused it. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the basis that if you can uh, teach a jack draw to count to four, does not mean they have mathematics. No, it doesn't. Okay, for example, and he assigned the apes' linguistic ability to the same level. So I'm not entirely certain it's fair. Mm -hmm. And that he wanted to argue that language was a uh, came from an organ. He, he wished to use that, that there was a language organ in the mind. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a, a, an organ in the sense of the liver no. of a discrete group of cells. No. Is it the right but, next to the memory mm -hmm. organ? Matter of fact, he, yes, or, or interpenetrating within them, since they're not physically located necessarily mm -hmm. in a distinct group of cells. Mm -hmm. He, in fact, wanted to say, though, that just as fundamental and unique an object the human liver is. It might have something to do with somebody else's, some other animal's liver, but it is a recognizably human thing, the human mm -hmm. liver. Mm -hmm. Identifiable. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not when you're eating it, but under other circumstances. Mm -hmm. That there was such a thing as the human language organ, and he used the word organ mm -hmm. for this purpose. That's very nice. Yeah. And that there would, for other cognitive faculties, there might be other organs, you know, uh, as innate as livers, mm -hmm. and as specific to humans as uh, the size of the appendix or the shape of the nose uh, in the species. And that he denied the existence of the language organ in an ape. Yeah. And therefore, whatever the ape did, it was not language. Uh -huh. yeah. now, well, uh, those that remarks, helped which me I a great I deal because it puts him very much in the ballpark of uh, faculty psychology. Um, that's say the old, the oldest school of psychology which existed, and, and was to some extent fostered by Spearman and um, Bert, and to some extent and uh, Galton, of course, um, to some extent. Um, but the term organ was taken over, I think, from from roots in phrenology, but at any rate, the idea, of course, was not really the were organs or bumped on the head or something any mm -hmm. longer, obviously. It was the idea that one had functional units, which were the faculty of reasoning, the faculty of memory, the faculty of every compartment you could think of. And this was carried even to the emotive domain much later by MacDougall. And um, you look at MacDougall's diagrams, and you could actually prune those too you wanted to, to give different pictures of how the emotions and the drives and so forth were related. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not laughing at these guys at all. Uh, I'm not in the least degree making fun in this apparently you know, curious kind of comment. I think they are fun in the sense that all things are fun. <laughs> I hope these are fun. So, I mean, in precisely the same way they have fun. I mean, because I think scientific things are to played with. Uh, they are sort of objects of play in some yes. sense of the word. Otherwise, it would be boring. Well, it would be stupid. I mean, they, more than boring. Yeah. Quite. And um, yeah, it certainly be boring anyhow. And <laughs> the, 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 I know they're decrying this, but I mean, it does identify him pretty strongly with what, of course, is, is aim, was being aimed at him by the psychologist, and it's particularly illuminating for me because I read that book and I had met Chomsky very briefly on several occasions, and um, I, they, they, they sort of then tally together, and you'll see he was being defensive in that mode of, if I might say so, learned garbage. Um, um, it was Miller in that mathematical psychology thing of a jig, and what it's called. Um, and uh, it explains why he was being defensive. That people were accusing him of belonging to the often discredited, so-called, faculty of psychology. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I don't, I'm not willing to discredit them. I think they had a good grain of truth in them, as, as other psychologists do. I don't know whether I agree with Chomsky or not, and I certainly wouldn't adopt that particular stance myself, but on the other hand, it does that explain to me a great deal of why he wrote that stuff yeah, no, in that context, too. There, there are two things. One that's taken from another question. Uh, I think that, that he, in at least, I think I'm representing his words accurately, and I think the thrust of his the reason for using the word organ was that this is the manner in which he declared that that which he discovered was genuinely universal. Yeah. Let's say what you discover yeah. about my liver is much the same as we will discover about yours. Mm. Uh, these things may be shaped by consumption of alcohol, uh, diet of a mm. source, physical exercise, and the like. Mm -hmm. But the reason why his transformational grammar was asserted to be universal as the rather than than ever going out and actually demonstrating the universality of the transformational grammar, mm -hmm. which Chomsky yeah. pipes don't usually bother. And Deborah, yeah. who was here last time, also asserted there was evidence to the contrary, that mm -hmm. to say it is not universal. Yeah. So, unfortunately, yeah. I asked her whether anybody went to a Chomsky and, or a Chomsky and confronted them with the evidence. She said no one ever bothered. You see, the, the Chomskyites and the anti-Chomskyites uh, never converse mm -hmm. at all, uh, which is unfortunate. But that was the means by which he moves the question of why are these notions universal back well, one state by stating that they are as innate as livers. I don't think he used as livers, but I mean I will use that to be more. The second point. No, it makes sense there. It's good. I it does make sense. Like, it, it, mm. it, it gives you a motivation for for declaring the universal. My question is, since I don't know the book from which you were mentioning the papers, what was the thrust of their conclusions about Look. various sorts of finite state machines? Did they conclude that, yes, finite state machines of those categories could generate the necessary utterances? Because they concluded that nothing could be said. It's rather like those wonderful books on, on statistics, they end up set by saying, eventually, particularly with experimental trimmings to them, they end up by concluding the miraculous, usually miraculous disguised, uh, assertion uh, that you, you can't predict the unpredictable. Um, these are enormous tomes about, about the subject, usually supported by experimental data, which <laughs> says you can't, you can't predict the unpredictable. And this is the main assertion in the book. And, uh, in fact, this book, as far as one can see, is that it says that mathematics says little or nothing about anything that's genuinely psychological. Gordon, well, can we bring this back now to discussion of language in the context of your work and the, the pre-cast yeah. linguistics and the experiments that you performed. Yeah, well, the pre-cast linguistics, all I really don't want to say about that, I guess, is that there was a series of experiments which well documented in those couple of papers which I suggested to the ARI. I mean, it's well exemplified and also well documented in which um, Toward the end of the era, when in fact I was making conversation theory, but was therefore extremely interested in detailed styles of perceptual motor learning, as we call in the trade, um, skills of a fairly complex sort, uh, but, but essentially a response type complex stimuli. Um, looked at the way in which people reacted to certain patterns. And these patterns were presented in the form of a, uh, an ordered arrangement. In fact, they, they were decomposed, but they had, in fact, uh, a situation like this, as I recall it. A, B, C, D. Better if I draw it out, A, B, C. I can never remember how these are done. A, B, D. Uh, a. C, D, and then that must be B, C, D, A, B, A, C, A, B, A, B, C, B, D, A, C, a, sorry, A, B, C, D, and uh, I'm going to draw this good, I'm seeing out if you don't mind, because it's, it's 
illustrates what I was thinking of in those days as a learning strategy. That gives A, B, A, D, uh, and B, C. Uh, that goes to A, C, A, D, B, C, B, D. That goes to A, B, D, B, D, A, B, A, D. Uh, that goes to C, D. Um, C goes to C, D. Do you want to excise that one? I have to excise it, don't I? You're quite right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. And that's the one going in here, AC. Yeah, that's the one that should be going there, shouldn't it? That's it. Okay. Fair? Yep. I will get these things wrong anyhow, so it's a very good idea if I draw them out. A, B, A, C, A, D. B terms. B terms, B terms. I don't know why it's so hard and clearer to draw these things out, even if you're all mistaken about them, but I think it makes it clearer for me anyhow. Now, each of the paths in that diagram can be regarded as, this is regarded as a complex stimulus, unordered. Okay? And it's a visible stimulus of some kind coming up on a board. And then you had responses, which were alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and similarly alpha beta gamma alpha beta delta alpha gamma delta and beta gamma delta i believe you to put the rest in except for alpha beta gamma delta at the bottom uh, and you had the cartesian product of those two quasi lattices um, because they have no um, LUB and they at least up a bound. Sorry, no greatest lower bound of particle forces, no greatest lower by GLB. Uh, and um, they, um, these were the learning strategies. In other words, you take the Cartesian product of those two and plot a path on it, mm -hmm. then you will have what I call a learning strategy. Hang on now. Um, what now, are the ABCs again? They are complex stimuli, visual. So what would be an A the, stimuli? It would be a collection of lights of the sort illustrated in that paper. If you, look at the, if you look at the picture of the thing, of the layout board, mm -hmm. it might be easier otherwise to draw the layout board exactly. But I think there's a picture of the stimulus board. I think it's there. No, the wrong one. The wrong one, sorry. And somewhere in there, there is the whole thing drawn. There we are, yes. Okay. That's very yeah. Okay, then. So, so I'd like to pass that around or something, and uh, would so be... So the particular groupings of, of lights, and what uh -huh. is the alpha, beta, gamma, Particular delta? groupings of micro-switches. Uh-huh. Right. Rather light than piano keys. Right. Carry on. Uh, but with a definite action. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> the adaptive machine in this case looked at people's learning and adopting one of several different strategies, which it adapted to find out, tried to optimize their learning to respond to complex stimuli by pressing, making complex responses like on the keyboard. The stimuli were unordered, in precisely the sense they exhibited up there. So the responses, in other words, it the order of the response to a particular stimulus did not matter, providing that each A, B, C, D had alpha, beta, gamma, D, it was delta, or something, or A, B, C had alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, and uh, so it, wasn't, it was irrelevant in what order these things occurred. Uh, the rate of occurrence was important, and one of the ideas, one of the adaptive variables, actually, was to increase the pace, as well as to display stimuli of different complexity according to the level of performance reached and of course to back up or down this structure which is not unlike kind of entailment mesh but it, it isn't an entailment mesh it's, it's a sort of quasi lattice it's the kind of thing you're using in here essentially it's the 
kind of structure in, in, in Saki. Can you give us an example in terms of somebody sitting down to this? Yeah, uh, if you look at that um, picture uh, in there of the response board, or maybe a better picture somewhere else, but that's quite a good one because it... Um, no, I meant in terms of what... what no, no, I mean, I'm sitting in front of this thing in a cubicle. Right. Um, my hands are resting on the stimulus board. Right. I am attempting some task or other, which consists in pressing keys in response to lights. Right. I am given a path which is also indicated to me on an auxiliary display, illustrating where I am. And the ways in which I can learn it are defined in this product here, uh, the product of those, those terms, the stimulus and response term. And the machine is trying to pick away, and does pick away, and it adapts over a period of ups and downs in the learning, which are recorded indeed in that paper and some typical curves, uh, to show how it can select different paths which are suiting people and how people will occasionally change and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, in the course of these experiments, it became very evident that if you did uh, latency analysis by doing uh, appropriate time averages rather than simply uh, rather than by doing a Fourier analysis of the latency, which would also have been possible and you take it out, you would have taken it out the time domain and put it into frequency domain, that people were inclined for all or part of the task to be what we call stringers or clumpers. That's to say they would literally address their attention as a rather trivial task to play a sequence, whether it be one, two, one, two, three, one, two, four. And Quite interesting things could be said about the microstructure of this sequence, how, for example, the terms overlapped, and what happened when, for example, the position of beta crossed over in latency response time, latency in response time, the latency of another for all responses that were ultimately correct, those that contained certain sorts of mistakes, etc. Can I? Right. Where mis Sorry? Yes, of course. Excuse me. Is that enough detail, or do you want to go over no. a little more what, what the machine does in order to choose what is shown next? I think, I think we have this situation. In the cubicle, they're presented with a stimulus. The, the mm -hmm. system requires that the uh, subject flip the right micro switches in response. So this is the skill that is trying to be learned. And the skill is represented in this lattice structure of A, B, C, D, all the way up to the other combinations. And the complexity of the skill is, is, in a sense, from the easiest one, namely, the stimulus presented is, is A, and so the required response is the flipping of micro switch alpha, all the way to the stimulus being A, B, C, D, requiring alpha, beta, gamma, and delta switches to be flipped in response. It's, now, yeah. Now, okay. Sure. So, fine. That's straightforward. That's just a machine where, given a particular stimulus, the operator is required to respond. What is it about the adaptive mechanism? Before we go on a little bit more about the microstructure of the responses and lumpers and stringers, well, let me take you back. Will, will, will any path delineated on that product set up there is a learning strategy, possible learning strategy. What determines the learning strategy? How does the machine choose one, well, one stimulus will, versus another? It will look at how people deal initially in quite detail, latency as well, as well as correctness. I think we need to run this down in some detail. Latency as well as correctness. Okay, so... At what you're doing. So, for example... It will look at what, what, what you have done. It will compare them. But it will continually do this, and it will present a next group, which may or may not be right about in the sense that compared with some trials it makes on the others, but not in a random fashion, but orderly fashion, actually. They're known to be trials. It finds that this is indeed a good guess. If it is not, it goes back and adopts a different strategy. Okay, but now we need a, a very specific example of what it is guessing and It how is always starting with the bottom letter. So it tries, for example, putting a start with A, it rehearses the set A, B, C, D. So can you press one thing? Uh, um, it goes up to present you with A, B, A, C, A, D, B, C, B, D. Excuse me a second. Based on any success of doing A, B, C, D? Yes, no latency attached to both. So as, as long as you respond within a reasonable length of time. The latency and correctness. Right. As long as you respond correctly to within a reasonable length of time to um, the stimulus. The detail a, of the experiment, I think, is given there, and I'm therefore going to be inaccurate. There is a restriction on it. You have to be within such an interval. Okay. Um, and I forget what the interval is, it's stated in that. No, no, no. And uh, the, re the details are stated there, I don't quite know what they were. So how many seconds or whatever, it was quite fast. 
having succeeded at apparently a simple version of the task, namely a uh, stimulus which requires only one... Yeah. But uh, might I add, you could be faster. I mean, this was the maximum you were fine, allowed. Fine, fine. So after I've succeeded at this so-called simplest uh -huh. aspect of the task, it then presents pairs A, B, A, C, or yeah, B, C. Yeah, make it back again. Well, uh, hold on, though. Yeah. Uh, so as it moves ahead now, it's still measuring me on latency and correctness. Yeah. And does it pick different ones, A, B, as opposed to A, D, as opposed to D, C? Yeah. It tries all different ones. Yeah, it doesn't make it, no, it's always going to do enough to get up to A, B, C, or A, B, D, okay, or fine. something by some path. How does it choose the path? By examining what has been done in the past, in terms of latency and correctness. And how does it choose which more complex one to pick? Depends if you're fast to start and which you, whether you tend to do them together, okay. which you tend to do together. So let's say that I tend to do A, B very fast. Well, it will present you with A, B properly. It will present you with something containing B on the top line. It'll have to present you, of course, with the other, with other representatives on the bottom line, which are going to be sufficient to get to A, B, C, D. But hang on, if I'm good at A, B, does it then suggest well, to me A, B, C as opposed to B, C, D? Well, I don't know. It depends entirely on what you've done with C, because you've already dealt with C, and you've already dealt with D when you were doing the task at the very lowest. I'm not succeeding in what I'm trying to do. No, look, you me are, I mean, sorry, it uses me. the information. But yeah. how and what? Well, first of all, it takes your, it, it ends up with a set of mean latencies and correctnesses. Okay. In fact, a whole set of them, perhaps, because it may have returned very often to those lot, bottom lot. So it's always got A, B, C, D response, right. if nothing else. So given you're very good at A, B, and given that it's taken something else, it may have composed A, B, C, D out of A, B, D, C, okay, which would allow you to go to direct to the top. But it might have composed it out of A, B, C, D even. It could have tried all of these others and get you direct to the top. It could perfectly well have gone to A, B, uh, C, D, and then from there direct to the top. It could have gone from A, B, and then using information that you were good at C, A, C, and then still having information, of course, about D, DC so and presents you with A, B, C, and B, C, D, and then get to the top. So, in so general, these are just examples. They can always go back again, too. So, in general, it looks at what I have performed well at hmm. and suggests it as the path to which hmm. it gets it, to yeah. what it considers the most complex thing. Yeah. So, would it okay. offer me offer the uh, client A, B, C, D before it had exhausted the three letter combinations? As you say, having yeah, it can go right to the top. So that, that's what you mean. In other words, it is not strictly mm. speaking, although it started yeah, with a single letter. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've drawn in the, the bone structure, if you like, the possible strategies would include, for example, well, I should have done this actually, would include, for example, anything that composed that, okay, as well as something that did that. Uh, and these are all, remember, reversible in some good sense of the word, and the remains are retained. That's quite possible. But the rule it's also quite possible that you added on A, B, and C to get there, um, and that you added on. Uh, let's say C D E C D and A get there and you add it on D to get there. Would it, it eventually teach the entire st structure or worry about No, it, it it teaches the ability to because of the similar similar sets unordered. It teaches the ability to respond within a simple interval to any combination. But it might do A, B, C, D yeah. before it did A, B, D. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Sure. Were, were the combinations that it used to generate possible stimuli to present always binary? That is to say, you couldn't just go from no, to but go a, B, from C, three D. to one, or you could go from four to four. So, did it, 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 what would be the condition that? 
of someone having... But actually, it would always occur. You would always try out one of these paths first. You would always try minimal addition first. This is why it is a kind of lattice-like structure. And it tries the minimal addition first, but it doesn't mean it's confined to that. It has a go at the proposition <coughs> that it's easier to add on one thing. Mm -hmm. But that isn't... Uh, it, it can always fall back into a different position, no, because its experience of the complex response up there... I was, I was curious there, under what it conditions back. it tried something. I mean, would it ever mm -hmm. just endeavor to go from the individual things, A, B, a, B, C, D, to go directly to the A, B, C, D. Yeah, it will, it'll, it'll fall back, of course, because it's going to, under that rubric, be presenting everything, mm -hmm. including that. Mm -hmm. It will, of course, fall back to the others when it finds this component that isn't, isn't working. This does not mean to say you just press four buttons down there. It means that all possible combinations are presented, including triples and singles and pairs and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the stimulus components are active. That's why I said it's a product set of these two. So what? And it's not... Uh, that, that is in other words, A, B, C, D is not just four lights appearing in a row to which you, you, you press a button. It contains all possible components, including that one. So knowing the skill A, B, C, D means that you could do any, yeah. any set, of yeah. any order... Yeah, any yeah. I mean, the thing is... is huh. is, a, is a, a presentation in the order you like. Now, a typical string strategy, a very pure stringing strategy, would be to arrive at a situation where you could deal with all these response components by adding on That's a typical learning strategy for Stringer. And is pretty invariant, actually, because if you would look at the... You find not only not only can you characterize it in terms that I've gone into in those papers, um, namely in terms of the sort of path and the response latencies and so on, you get an invariant way in which when mistakes are made, say in respect to component alpha to A or the beta to B, you uh, get a crossover in the latency average diagrams and the latency histograms in there in such a way that you get a crossover and the crossover will occur with a stringer you get typically an error when this say this might be C latency that might be B latency and that one perhaps moves up there in the interval of the I'm average. Sorry, you get the error when? When the latency, this is latency Typically, an error will occur, or a mistake will occur, when this part of the histo latent histogram is crosses. In other words, you get faster at B is a unique element, it's part of a string, and C you get better at, you will typically get confusion at that point of crosses, for example. So there is a sort of particular structure to the latent. Uh, which, which, which reflects very ac accurately, actually, the, the way in which you've learned the thing. And in particular, the way in which you react to mistake when there is a change, as there always is in the, in the, in the latent histogram. And uh, then a string of latent histogram is laid out literally like that, a pure string or something. But nevertheless, you will find that the bars of the histogram cross over. When there is a crossover, a confusion will occur. And you can differentiate between those where the confusion is engendered in B or C component or where the confusion is engendered in some other component and so on. By this you mean that, that uh, he, would, he would not become confused <laughs> well, if a guy he makes always mistake. was a little faster at A than he was at B than he was uh, at C. This seldom happens, B. actually, that if, if only because if, of muscular if they fatigue. Yeah. That A, since it was his first yeah. thing mastered, always he was faster at. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the typically, because uh, it, it's, it seldom occurs, probably only because of muscular fatigue. I mean, that indeed, if you're doing something very fast, you get fatigued a little bit, one of the things. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, so it seldom happens that you get a completely invariant pattern, but you get a gradually shifting, mm -hmm. stable histogram, which gradually shifts. And mistakes tend to be made when a crossover occurs. 
may needn't occur, you can characterize some things, not, but I mean, the point is, you will always get, for example, one of the invariants is that somebody who has actually learned this way, and this appears to be, according to the machine's continual experimentation, if you like, a, uh, an optimum path of learning for you, uh, then you are in a position actually to make predictions such as there will be a, a mistake engendered either in these particular components of the stimulus response situation or else perhaps in those components which represent, let's put them down as, uh, let's put them down by hypothesis that this is D A. Okay. Uh, what's moving is it's supposed to be uh, a relative to C and B. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether that will engender a, well, some subject it will engender a mistake in D rather than A or B, others it will engender a confusion in B or A. And uh, that is just a prediction. I mean, it's one of the things you can predict of a, a stringing response. And a stringing response is indeed just a response characterized by that and the latency histogram like that. And it's a, a linear approach to a past problem. It looks as though the attention is being directed rapidly from one component to another. They're both examined in sequence, and some sort of algorithm is used. Now, do you have. Uh... You inspect these separate lights in sequence and react to them. More separate did attributes. You, did you vary the. Uh, did you have any control of, of the patterns in which the mm. machine presented this oh, stuff yes. such that you could then, for example, find that if you gave them a predominance of information, or if you varied the amount of information that came weighted so as to discourage a stringing strategy or encourage seeing a great deal of other kinds of information that, that they would learn more slowly or that they, they were good at screening that out and extracting from it what they wanted. And, you know, understand the question? The teacher, yes, teacher did that actually in other in other experiments rather than this one. And uh, a lot of that stuff was done not with this particular setup, as far as I recall, though those papers were more accurate perhaps than my immediate recall of it. Um, the, um, as far as I recall, we didn't give falsifying or incomplete data in this particular experiment. It was chiefly um, a very detailed study, actually, of a situation of uh, learning and uh, adaptive did you have any pre presuppositions about that there would be stringers and other kinds of yeah. strategies coming yeah. out before you built this? Yeah. Sure. I didn't realize the microstructure would be quite so clear in the, in the latency pattern, and I certainly predicted this. It was based on a whole series of other stuff, and how I could predict empirically, I predicted it without what well, would deal with empirical support, I and mean, you already ought to have. Uh, typical. Um, I mean, there, there are these earlier experiments which are accounted better in Lewis and myself, general paper actually, rather than in that paper, Lewis and me. Gordon, when I visited you in 72 and saw, saw the machine, how far along was it? I think that we were past this, weren't we? I can't recall, but this, this gadgetry may still be enough until we arrive in 72. Uh, CAST was coming into existence, yeah. and was in existence when you came, as I recall it. It may not have been fully operational. Well, it oh, was. it was, yes, no, it was. No, it was, John, actually. CAST was. was, well, this had long been dismantled. Yeah. It was at the old lab in Hill Rise, That's and right. it, um, the CAST was built, one of the first equipments built at Monte Rennes. Mm -hmm. basement lab there. Mm -hmm. When we had the office down in, in, in what, two Richmond Hill, and the, the lab was up in the basement of Montague Road. Uh, it's a paradigm sort of, uh, sorry, <laughs> what are you um, more difficult to draw. I can draw it like that very easily, but it actually entails either going back from there to there, or going back from there to there. So, you seem to have two identical lines here. The middle line clumper. is A, B, and C, D, or A, B, C, D? A, B, and C, D. And I've drawn them with arcs, trying to indicate. And uh, there will, of course, be a return 
some stage to other pairs that they can be dealt with. Um, but this is... This is only one example of ways in which you bump. Now, in this case, you tend to get a latent histogram, which looks like that. Well, it's not even, it's, it's even closer sometimes, it's just one, uh, which is called these, clumper. These tests were never, never explicitly tests of uh, language. No, no, but one could make some predictions about the fact that people would learn strat how you use strategies, which were the point we were addressing, uh, in learning about other things. If they did so, very definitely do so. Whether they'd be the same strategy is a very different matter. Sort of an algorithm and a piano chord strategy uh, hardly seem too likely. But certainly the people would adopt strategies. My own prediction, because at that time I had revised in tally my view of what a subject was, having had too many subjects who couldn't be satisfactorily isolated from their environment, and having far too many cases in this experiment where people chiefly played with the machine rather than uh, using it as a training device, and it was quite rich enough to act as a plaything of, of some, some richness, um, I decided it was no longer possible to really distinguish between the boundary of the subject and enough. I mean, there were lots of subjects there inside one person. And, uh, the machine was exteriorizing quite a lot went on anyhow and um, this happened as soon as not perhaps during useful training sessions which are queued to one hour or something because that uh, that's good for experimental psychology but it occurred so frequently after that interval that i became convinced that there was no way of uh of distinguishing um subject boundaries, and uh, although the experiments were success for their purpose, and they demonstrated some interesting things about psychological invariance, uh, they also had uh, an extremely negative finding, namely that the whole presupposition on which adaptive machinery or non-adaptive machinery or experimental psychology is based, the major presuppositions of, um, of environment subject boundary machine subject boundary fall down in case the environment is a reasonably adaptive machine anyhow. Um, and a fortiori if there's, if there's another subject around or if they're allowed to think to themselves so they can alter from being a string of a clumper in the same head, which I must say they do in a very definite way. It's quite interesting when they suddenly switch. Uh, they don't gradually do it, they suddenly switch. and. Um, and uh, the um, so I expected there would be some tendency in terms of the learning strategy, which would be traced out on a chart of this kind, perhaps, or on a chart. In fact, the chart was later called an entailment mesh. This thing, I think, almost is probably fails to be, which is defined uh, for future reference. This is the carrier that they call as uh, the union order preserving union of several prunings of an entailment mesh, okay? Mm -hmm. And that if one took a thing called an entailment structure, which is death, the order preserving union defined. of several prunings, yes, yeah, defined as the... Could you uh, go back over that a little more slowly? Yeah. An entailment mesh on which I propose to plot learning strategies much the way that by superimposing pictures of this kind, I could plot learning strategies on a, a semi-lattice. But I intended to use a, a thing called entailment mesh instead, in which the uh, letter-like things would no longer be uh, stimulus-response pairs or whatever. It would be uh, indeed uh, topics uh, of uh, type encountered and representative of concepts in the head, perhaps, though this was still unclear to me now as beginning conversations here, so I already had a actually more sophisticated notion of what a topic was. But if I, if I had things called topics, it seemed to be a good phrase to use, a somewhat educational concept, anyhow, talk about topics of the subject matter. If I made a, an entailment mesh of these topics, I should be able to plot 
uh, certain kinds of graph. I wouldn't expect, for example, that everybody would do like that. Some might go up through CD and then uh, BCD, uh, and I'd call those also the same type of learning strategy. Okay? But um, I would expect something of that sort, and uh, I would expect that under certain circumstances this might even change. And uh, I was holding, in fact, that it, uh, the style, sorry, that the, the, the tendency, the propensity to select one kind of strategy or another, one kind out of a class, like those representatives of separate class, um, would, um, uh, that they would be peculiar to a psychologically integral unity which I chose to call a psychological individual, uh, or alias a participant. Only under certain circumstances may a participant or psychological individual be accurately identified with a biological individual, such as an organism or a subject. Um, and I expected that these invariants would belong I'm quite surprised to find that they were more closely attached to biological individuals than I thought, but this turned out later to be an artifact of the educational system, in fact. And well, why? 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 Pretty well. Um, I mean, individual difference psychology would hold, of course, that there ought to be these, different, uh, these differences, and there are, but the invariants are actually very much more those of psychological individuals than they are of, of, of people. There are invariants of people as well, obviously. But the class of invariants is a bit different. And actually some of them overlap. The tendency to go beyond evidence in the broader sense or to uh, perform analogical reasoning tends to be very much more, for example, as far as I can see, an invariant of biological individuals, and it can be put into correspondence with all psychological individuals of a particular biological individual. But uh, in this sense, uh, this case is very useful because this is one of the things that can be encouraged in a person. <laughs> so that all of the participants or psychologically individual parts or perspectives, whatever you like to call it, inside of somebody would be improved by, of some person would be improved. So this now becomes a, a uniform uh, enhancement in some sense. It may be just another faculty, I don't know. It's, it's not unlike it, individual different psychology is a bit like faculty psychology uses different phrasing. And, um, the, I certainly expected there would be learning strategies. And uh, it was obvious that since I was dealing with topics, I was also thinking very much at that stage about language, though I can't see any, my own thinking, clear boundary. I regarded this as a primitive linguistic transaction. Um, not so primitive when it came to the play transaction. And, um, in fact, far from print when it came to the play-like transactions, which are not accommodated by this stuff, and typically don't appear in publications like that paper, because as is usual, uh, the experiment went on for a certain interval, after which the session stopped and another session was started, and the, the sessions were continued until such a moment as the skill had been learned. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the um, and recordings, of course, were kept, and the machinery was, of course, loaded up uh, with the same value, mm -hmm. charged capacity, <laughs> literally, <laughs> for each experiment. Uh, it took the charge on the last session, read it in with a valve voltmeter, with a, with a battery, with a valve voltmeter attached to it, high impedance voltmeter, and. Um, so the conditions were sort of reinstated in some sense, the beginning of the following session, and we'll start off with a tabular run. And uh, the, um, I did expect, in other words, in starting these 
more explicitly linguistic and verbal linguistic or, or visuographic, highly linguistic experiments on learning that uh, academic learning, if you like, that I would find different learning learning strategies, and that they could be represented by markings on a, an entailment structure comparable to those markings I've made here. Um, perhaps a little bit greater great complexity, of course, but comparable in time. And um, I must, I've already addressed what I meant by an individual in the psychological sense, in contrast to a person. I have, I mean, both are individuals, uh, and, uh, but in general, any person contains a lot of psychologically unified systems. George Kelly would call, would have called core construct systems. And, uh, which is now a fairly well acknowledged branch of of, of psychology, but uh, it was for a long while neglected, of course, from people. But the um, Mildred Shaw, in particular, has advanced it, I guess. Um, I must say, what an entailment mesh is, in contrast to a picture of that kind, which is a pretty obvious sort of quasi lattice interpretation. Let me interrupt you. Uh, I think that may be beyond where we are here at the moment. Well, I was asked to relate to entailment mesh, so I didn't say what is the record of the oh, I What an entailment structure is. It, it's a thing which looks rather like that, excepting that instead of stimulus response pairs, there are things called topics, corresponding to topics in the subject matter. Um, these appear to be distinct concept in people. This is how they're elicited and written down. Um, they appear to be common to a population of persons who are going to act as subjects. Uh, formally, an entailment mesh, an entailment structure, sorry, is here I'm going to just repeat it, as Paul asked me to do is the order-preserving union of several prunings under distinct topics of an entailment mesh. And it's exactly the sort of structure that you saw up on probability theory on CAS. Go. I think you saw the probability theory one, didn't you? That big wall display with the marker lights and stuff on it. Yeah. Well, that was an entailment, stru entailment structure. And nowadays it would be known